Oh hey, it's Wes. And it has been a crazy few days. I have not slept in about 36 hours because I got my hands on this, the new Nikon Z8. There is one completely ridiculous and personal reason why I don't think I could buy this camera. And I'll tell you at the end, because it doesn't matter to anyone else. And I wanted to put it through its paces. I borrowed this camera from my friend Philip Boudreau. If you want to check out his work, there's a link. I am a Sony user. Maybe I have a bias. Obviously I have a bias. Everyone has a bias. But you might recall in my previous video where I talked about the Z9, I was so incredibly excited when it came out because of what it meant for the industry. And we're gonna go over a whole lot of that stuff, but when the Z8 was announced, I thought, man, maybe this is the perfect camera, especially for me. Is it? Let's see. Starting with the build quality. This camera you might just think is a mini Z9, but you'd kind of be a little bit wrong in that because the Z9 is milled from a solid block of magnesium for the most part. This one, however, Nikon says is made with carbon fiber reinforced polycarbonates. Honestly, I don't have a problem with that. One would expect it to be lighter than it is based on that, but this is a beefy camera, much more along the lines of like a D850 rather than a Z7 II or an A7 IV or an A1. It is significantly bigger and heavier than the A1, but that probably means something good for build quality. And Nikon specifically says that it is almost but not quite as weather sealed and almost but not quite as durable as the Z9. They want to keep giving you reasons to get that Z9 for an extra $1,500. Overall, this thing is much more rough and tumble than almost anything else in the mirrorless market, except for maybe the Z9 and possibly the R3. This is a 9.5 out of 10 for build quality. There is no doubt that this is going to... Uh, <laughs> get the job done, and not fail on you. Feature set. Once again, we have to compare this to the A1 and the Z9, and this is where it becomes explicit why it is that we have to do that. The primary thing that this is built around is the stacked 45 megapixel sensor. You might recall stacked sensors from Sony with the A9, A9 II, and the A1. This one has a similar stacked sensor, but this one is slightly faster read speed than on the A1. This one reads at 1 to 80th of a second, the A1 1 to 60th of a second. And so they do have very similar performance in many ways, which is good because the A1's a great camera. I loved using it, but it was too expensive for me. It's about 10 grand where I live. And with that stack sensor, we get to have silent shutter or turn a sound on, whatever you want to do. You get to shoot up to 1 32,000th of a second, which can be great when you're using a wide aperture prime and also gives you very low rolling shutter in video and in silent shutter. Let's say with the a7 IV, which we're recording on right now, if you're shooting in silent shutter and you pan that camera, just a gentle pan, you will get warpy lines, but not with a stacked sensor, such as on the A9 and the A1. Here's an A9 for reference. You've probably already heard all the specs anyway, so honestly, the easiest and most effective thing to do would just be to list how this compares directly to the A1 in terms of specs. What it has that the A1 doesn't is a slightly better silent shutter, better stabilization, 8K60 and raw recording options, and additionally, it will shoot over sampled 4K video while the A1 would do line skipping in a lot of circumstances. But it doesn't have everything. Number one, it doesn't have symmetrical card slots. One of those cards is always going to be limited to an SD, whereas the other one is a great CF Express Type B. There is still no redundant video recording internally, which is wild to me and a bit of a deal breaker for many. There is no vibration reduction or IBIS for fully manual third-party lenses. Incredibly frustrating in Sony, I can just set the focal length and go for it, and I do that a lot not currently able to tether to Lightroom, the Z9 took forever to be supported, and you can't use it as a mass storage device. You have to use proprietary Nikon software to plug this into your computer and very awkwardly get files off of it, if you don't have a card reader on you at a given time. And one more downside for the features is the viewfinder. I was not expecting this. I, I, I had read that spec before and I just kind of forgot about it. This has about the same viewfinder as this many years old A9 does in it. 
it's not even close to the clarity and the crispness of the viewfinder in the A1 and the A7R5. And when I was shooting in low light, I, it was really hard to tell whether or not it was getting focus. And so I'd have to go back and look at the image and zoom in. Whereas on like the A1 or the A7R5, you can see so crisply through the viewfinder that you essentially know whether or not you have the shot, whether or not it was perfectly in focus. This one, if your eyes are sharp enough, you're getting a little bit of screen door effect still, which is unfortunate for such a flagshipy camera. Back screen, however, miles better than the back screen on any Sony camera. It's brighter, it's crisper, it's bigger. Ugh, Sony, I've complained about this way too many times, but Sony drops the ball on all of their back screens. This doesn't have a mechanical shutter like the A1 does. Now some people might say that it's obsolete now, but with the mechanical shutter of the A1, that allows you to have a flash sync speed of 1 3 20th of a second, or 1 400th in APS-C mode, whereas this one, the sync speed is 1 200th of a second. After that, you're going into high-speed sync. Now, some people said that they had issues with banding in high-speed sync, but with my Godox flashes, I didn't have any issue with that. I couldn't actually produce any banding at 1 8000th of a second with an 8300 Pro, no matter what I did. So just apparently the compatibility is very strong with the Godox HSS system here. Whereas with something like the A7 IV or even the A9, you can get banding if you don't disable the electronic first curtain shutter at high HSS shutter speeds like 1 4,000th to 1 8,000th of a second. Whereas this one, there is no mechanical shutters, but it did great for me, no issues there, so that's fantastic. We will discuss in greater detail and comparisons LED banding in our image quality section, so stick around for that. Overall, it has almost everything, almost everything. It's a 9.5 out of 10 for feature set, no surprise there. Image quality, this one's easy. Uh, a lot of full frame sensors these days have very similar performance, and honestly, you would be hard pressed to tell the difference between a file coming out of this versus the A1 versus the R5. It's fantastic. I used this camera in a variety of scenarios. We did some commercial photography, we did theater photography in very low light, sort of between ISO 1200 and ISO 16000. That was challenging. And real estate photography at a building that required very high dynamic range. I didn't do any bracketing because I wanted to push it to its limits. And this did not disappoint, nor did it surprise. All right, it's time to dive in deep with some really nitty gritty stuff. I wanted to compare the LED artificial light banding against this, a slightly older stacked sensor on the A9, and a normal mechanical shutter and sensor like on the A7 IV. Now, why is this important? Well, almost all lights are becoming LED light sources, so this is very important. In this image we're looking at here, we have three layers of LED lights, the fairy lights in the background, which don't have tremendous sync. There is the red background light, which has like a medium level of sync capability, and the key light is very high quality, very stable. Let's see how they all interact. And so, if we look down here, we are comparing the Z8 there are no options to turn off and on things except for the shutter fine tuning. Shutter fine tuning didn't do a lot in this circumstance and you'll see why later on. And we have the A7 IV with its silent shutter, with the electronic first curtain shutter on, and full mechanical mode, electronic first curtain shutter off. Same for the A9 silent, EFCS on, EFCS off. Now as you can see there's not much of a difference at 1 60th of a second. They all look pretty similar. but even once we go up to 1 250th of a second, the slow scan speed of the A7 IV suddenly catches up with it in that the mechanical shutter is not sweeping the sensor at the same speed as the electronic first curtain, and so we're already getting banding on our background lights at 1 to a 250th of a second, which is just terrible. That's because that sensor scans very slowly. Now, no such issue on the A9, and no such issue on the Z8. But on this A9, we did manage to get in between the cycles of the lights in behind. It's not a band, just some of them don't look like they're on. Now, if we jump all the way to 1 8,000th of a second, we're going to see a lot of ISO noise here, but please ignore that. So on the A7 IV, in silent mode, you can see we have banding not just on our background lights, but we have banding on the red light cast on the wall, but no banding on the key light. 
and we have some bokeh interruption. The electronic first curtain shutter on, it's even worse, because not only do we have those banding artifacts, we also have the two shutters not lining up. Then we go for full manual, so we're full mechanical. Our shutter slit is out of sync with the lights in behind, but our bokeh is fine. We have no banding whatsoever, very nice. Generally, the best that one could expect. Then, the A9 at 1 8,000th of a second in silent mode. Our background red light has some issues. Our front light looks to be okay. And our bokeh is just fine, except we're out of sync a little bit. Now with the electronic first curtain shutter on, the mechanical and silent shutters are not lining up properly, so we have interruptions in the bokeh. And we have some weird artifacting with the lack of sync with the lights in the background. And our red light is banding, our key light is not. And here we have full mechanical, no artifacts at all, just uh, out of sync with our back lights. And then the Z8 at 1 8,000th, we have some banding with our red light, no banding with our key light, and it actually maintained full sync with our background lights somehow. Very intelligent flicker reduction going on here. Now, the most challenging test of all, we'll go to 1 32,000th of a second, and here things are looking very messy. First we'll start with the A9. Oh boy. Looks like we have some banding in our key light. Very gross. We have awful banding in our backlight. Wow, this is hurting my eyes. We're out of sync with our fairy lights, but we don't have bokeh interruption because there are no mechanical shutters to overwrite each other. But, interestingly enough, Z8 outperforms and somehow, with its automatic flicker reduction, manages to sync with these backlights, gets them all in perfectly. Now we're out of sync with our back red light, and looks like we have some issues with our key light as well. Not perfect, real messy here, but that's 1 32,000th of a second, you have problems. And as you can see, the A9 took longer to scan the sensor, which means we got more flashes in. The Z8 took less time to scan the sensor in larger chunks, and we have less flashes in. Both aren't great. <laughs> as you can see, having a mechanical shutter is still a better way of getting the job done in some circumstances. But in some situations, in some ways, it's still better because it can maintain a better sync with artificial lighting. Very intelligent syncing going on here, Z8, which gives us an interesting conclusion here. There are negatives, but there are also positives. It would appear that no particular sensor is perfect in this respect, so we still have to give it a 10 out of 10. Until Sony comes out with their new dual layer full frame image sensors that totally changes the game. Handling and usability. This one is very subjective and, oh, I had some issues with using this camera. On a Sony body, you have now one, two, three, four dials. So when I'm using my a7 IV, all these dials spin freely and you can assign them to different things. So I can have one for aperture, one for ISO, one for white balance, and one for shutter speed. Whereas this is still using the old Nikon concept of one for aperture, one for shutter speed, and then you hold this down to change ISO, hold this down to do exposure compensation, it's just a little bit more cumbersome. I would like to see other camera manufacturers adopt more dials because more control is always better. Now, in their defense, they have the control dial on this, but <laughs> it doesn't lock. And so by default, I think it comes set to aperture. And next thing you know, you're just bumping your aperture all over the place. I do not like this control wheel at all. Disabled immediately. <laughs> There's a bit of a learning curve with the body, you have tons of other buttons though, so once you get used to it, there are lots of ways to set this up, customize it, have shortcuts and so forth. So that's, that's perfectly fine. But the bad part about the usability, let's just cut to the chase here, because obviously this is a nice, comfortable, easy to use camera body. Number one, it's heavy. Number two, the battery life can be terrible. This is a big old camera that uses a lot of power and it's still using the old small battery form. Look how small this battery is compared to this camera body. This thing is just tiny. Nikon really should have come out with a new camera battery for this camera. It would have been annoying, but obviously it can't fit the one from the Z9. 
but it should have had a bigger one than what the Z7 II and Z6 II is using. It's, it's not enough. Another hit is the mismatched cards. You can't have two of one kind of card, and it's not fully redundant all the time. That's kind of annoying. There are no exposure zebras in photo mode. I don't know why Nikon hasn't implemented this yet. You can have them in video, but not in photo. And man, once you get used to having zebras in photo, you just can't go back. And one more bad thing, it is, although smaller than the Z9, it is bigger and heavier than the Sony A1, the Sony A7R5. It is a chonky camera. Feels good in the hand, but after a night of theater photography, I was shooting for five hours straight, just bang, 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 bang in my hand. Oh, it, it got to be a lot. I really wouldn't want to have this hanging off me for a wedding, but I know some people would and have no issue with that. But for me, handling and usability is an eight out of 10. Lots of pluses, but comes with some solid downsides too. Autofocus. This is where I'm gonna get really controversial. I apologize in advance. I've used the A1, I've used the A7R5, I've used the A9, the A9 II, A7, A7 IV, and I gotta say, in super low light, very challenging scenarios, this did not impress me. Yes, it is fantastic, it is fast, it is intelligent, has versatile, blah 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 blah. But, I noticed that it was hunting and missing shots more than I expected it to in very low light scenarios. So. I pull out my A9. This thing is several years old. It has my 85 1.4. This lens has terrible autofocus compared to all the other Sony lenses. So I set this at 2.8. I have this at 2.8 at 70 millimeters, 85 millimeters. And the A9 hit rate was the same as, if not better than the Z8. Now in the Z8's defense, I am more accustomed to using this, but I, sh I shouldn't have been able to do that well with it. The A7 IV, what we're recording on here, found eyes and faces and objects much more readily than the Z8 does. The A9, not as good for that, but the hit rate is better. And what really shocked me is that there is a blackout in this camera when you take pictures. So the screen blacks out. Now you might be used to that if you have a camera with a shutter or any other mirrorless camera, but when you're using the A9 or the A1, the only thing that disappears is your zebras. It is a completely blackout free experience. And when you're taking a lot of pictures, that has a huge impact on your autofocus. Not necessarily because it is hurting the camera's autofocus, but because you are losing track of what you're doing. I really did not expect this to have blackout in the shutter. It kind of threw me for a loop. It's hard to accept anything other than blackout free shutter once you get used to it. <laughs> I know I'm being really picky there. And then when compared to the A1, which just has manic bonkers autofocus, it just does not quite keep up. Now again, this is phenomenal and it's better than all but four cameras on the market when you count everything. So it's just not better than the A1, the A7R5, and the R3. That's about it. It's still not tops. So the autofocus, it's a nine out of 10. I'm a little disappointed that Nikon still hasn't pushed that far forward with autofocus yet. This thing obviously has a much more capable, faster processor than the A9 does. Like, you can feel the A9 pushing against its limitations, but still doing a phenomenal job. I feel like there's a lot of room to grow in here. Moving on to value, and this is what really gets me interested in this camera. This comes out at $4,000. The A1 is $6,500. That is $2,500 less. That's, that's an A7 IV less. So you can buy this and an A7 IV, or maybe a Z6 II for the same price as an A1, which is crazy. It's $1,500 less than the Z9, which is $5,500. The A7R5 is $3,900, and the R5 is $3,900. Now, some people say that this is the competitor to the A7R5. That is ridiculous. <laughs> Although the A7R5 has slightly more... Although the A7R5 is slightly more intelligent autofocus than this does, everything else, this just blows the A7R5 out of the water. I, I do not know why someone would buy the A7R5 over this camera. The extra pixels, not useful for most people. The body feels more rugged and durable and that's stacked. 
shutter-free sensor is just phenomenal. Sure, the image quality is no better, but just the versatility in both image and video of having that stacked silent sensor is just phenomenal. The sensor in the a7R5, the silent shutter is just garbage. Like the rolling shutter and in the video, the video is line skipped. Whereas this technically has better video than the A1 because it doesn't line skip. You can get all those lines in there. You can shoot raw codecs. You can, you can shoot in ProRes. Like you're getting so much more for your money here. So in my mind, this is a direct competitor to the A1 and beats it in many ways. Doesn't beat it in every way, but in many ways it does for so much less money. It's a pretty easy 10 out of 10. One caveat though, there is a lot going on inside this camera to get there and most people don't have a business or a workflow that can maximize the value of this camera. And finally, the big reason why this camera was awful for me personally to use and why I'm not sure that I could buy it without possibly damaging it. <laughs> right here, this flip out nubbin right here, when I hold this camera up to my eye, that little nubbin touches the bump of my nose, my gigantic nose. And by the end of a night of intense shooting, my nose hurt so much. <laughs> it's just the littlest thing and oh my goodness, this became incredibly painful for me to use. So if you have a huge nose, watch out for that. Now if I did buy this, like, let's say somebody gave me one for free, I would probably just file this thing right down, <laughs> which is ridiculous, but you do what you gotta do. So our total score comes to 56 out of 60, or 93.3%. Just a phenomenal score. This is a very well-rounded camera. Now, unfortunately, it's still not the perfect camera for me. I just found the usability to be a little bit wanting. The battery life is, oh boy. Some people said Sony's had bad battery life, but this burns through them real fast. But the results speak for themselves. This does pretty much everything and does it so well. A little big for my britches and a little sharp for my nose. It's kind of annoying to me that Nikon has the Z7 II, which is kind of middling in performance, way behind the times, and then the next thing that they have is the Z8 and Z9, which has just blistering performance and like all the features and crazy fast. In many ways, I was hoping that the Z8 would be somewhere more in between the Z9 and the Z7 II, but this one has so few compromises that it's still way up there at the top of the market. I feel like they need a Z7.5 <laughs> or a Z7 III because compared to the Z6 II and the Z7 III, this thing is just a monster. <laughs> Let me know what you think about the Z8 down below. If you want to pick one up, feel free to use one of the links in the description to help support this channel and feed these fat cats. Until next time. <sighs> I think I will sadly give this camera back, but I will continue and go take some photos.